you probably heard the case of um, UFC fighter, UFC light heavyweight. Oh, tell me. Yeah, one, of the, one of the top guys. And he, he experienced a home invasion. Okay. Right? And this, this caused some controversy because the articles about this were labeled uh, something like, um, it was the toughest fight of my life. And if you hear from him, it's like, okay, that makes sense. You know, if, if I ended up dying or from a gunshot wound or whatever, the, at least he'd be hurt enough that they could deal with it. So that was my mindset going, in, going into that situation. And, I, and fortunately, he wasn't armed. There's right. some crazy guy on drugs, just high out of his mind, breaks into his house in the middle of the night. He's sleeping. He yeah. is not ready for a fight. I mean, nobody is in those situations, right? Oh. This crazy guy comes in. He, he wrestles him down to the ground. He tries to control him. And from my perspective, I'm seeing, okay, there's, there's a trained cage fighter trying to control violence. Yeah. And there's a crazy methed out crackhead trying to inflict violence. Who might have a weapon. And those are two very different. Yes, he might have a weapon. And that's yeah. something, you know, Anthony brought up again and again. He didn't know if this guy had a weapon. He right. thought he might die. He thought yeah. he might get shot, stabbed, something yeah. like that. He just wanted to make sure his family was safe. He said, no normal human being is, is able to fight like that. He said, I am by no means the baddest dude on the planet. But listen, he's top 100. Oh, damn. Out of all the humans on the planet, Anthony Smith is one of the top 100 baddest motherfuckers Straight walking up. the earth. But he's a regular Joe, and I had a hard time dealing with him, and he took everything I gave him, every punch, every knee, every elbow. He took every single one of them and kept fighting me. At one point, Smith said his mother-in-law brought him a kitchen <laughs> knife, which he held to... Take a skill set like like mixed martial arts, a combat sport, and try to apply that to an MMA in, or try try to apply that to self defense. Yeah. In some ways, in some ways, it's not enough. For example, if if there's a weapon, a force multiplier, it, it's not enough. Right. Like no matter what your hands and feet can do, it's simply never enough. And in other ways, it's too much. Somebody attacks you, you you choke them unconscious. I mean, in some states in the U.S., that means you're you're serving prison time. Exactly. You know, even if you don't kill them. Right, right. But the guy took it. The fact that the guy only weighed 170 pounds, and it says Smith fights at 205 pounds. He's walking around 230. Oh, easy. yeah. He's and a he's big smashing kid. this dude that's, you know, a legit 60 pounds lighter than him, which is crazy. He said he experienced a wide range of emotions after. It's like, I, I've got two small children, one's seven, one's four. Sometimes I'll be like lying on my bed, and then they run in in the morning while I'm sleeping, jump on my <laughs> chest, like feet first. And right. I'm like, oh, that hurts. And they're like, daddy, yeah. you're supposed to be a cage fighter. <laughs> Suck it up. I'm like, oh, I wasn't ready. Exactly. It's not yeah. the same. So even like small kids can catch you with the element of surprise. So there are so many variables to, to self-defense that are simply not addressed by combat sports and uh, the overwhelming majority of martial arts. Which is why when people ask me about self-defense, I generally say self-defense is a legal term. You want yeah. a self-defense expert? Talk to a lawyer. Yeah. Like find out what the laws are, where you live. Right. And they will vary widely. Yeah. So, so I got to ask you, um, how much do people ask you about self-defense on, on your YouTube channel? It's well, got to come into play, right? I mean, since the original purpose of karate is supposed to be self-defense, then people who are interested in the origins or the traditional aspect, they always want to learn more about self-defense and how to apply these esoteric moves that we do today the original way, right? But people who do modern sports-based karate, yeah. they might not be as interested. They might see it as an exotic hobby to learn how to use the moves in self-defense, but they would rather just score points and become world champions maybe. And that's a completely different skill set, right? And somehow, I try to bridge yeah. the gap between these two worlds because I call myself a karate nerd because I love to embrace all aspects of the art. And when, I look, and when I look at the kata, for example, you know, the form, same as one would do in Kung Fu, for example. Yeah, yeah. Then these techniques that were recorded and transmitted and, you know, uh, shared on the island of Okinawa among these different masters and later became what we today refer to as karate, they were supposed to be used in self-defense in ways that you won't see in MMA, even though MMA is supposed to be like this full contact, brutal cage fighting. Like for example, there are moves where you learn how to defend against a hair grab. Nobody's gonna grab your hair in an MMA fight. There are moves where you defend against yeah, multiple opponents. Especially not mine. Uh, right, exactly. And so the, the contextual premise is so different 
But people who only scratch the surface think they're the same. But when you start digging deeper, which is what I do since I'm a karate nerd, right? That's literally my job. Then you start to see that, well, there are, there are differences, right? And I think that once you start exploring these differences, then you can truly learn the difference and understand how self-defense works because you also have verbal de-escalation tactics and situational awareness. And all of these things that somebody who might experience a home invasion might not be prepared for, even though they're a trained MMA fighter, just like you said. You've tried a lot of these self-defense techniques with your MMA fighters, right? What has the experience been from yeah. those experiments? Okay. You know, most of them I can tell right away, like, this, this is not going to work because, you know, I've, I've been in this massive variety of positions. I mean, you, you just spend like five minutes sparring and you, you'll go through, you'll go through hundreds of different positions. Yeah. Right? And if you spend a hundred hours sparring, a thousand hours sparring, 10,000 hours sparring, you, you can see right away, like, yeah, that, that's not the way pressure works. That's not the way right. position works. That's not the yeah. way leverage works. Right. But every once in a while, like there was this one, I, I, I honestly began to question. There was this woman named uh, uh, Debbie Stevens, and she actually has a pretty good self-defense channel. Like most of it is, I would say, pretty good information. But then she had this one video, just, just one, where she taught that a slap to the side of the neck, an open hand slap, would instantly knock somebody out. And I was like, <laughs> I, that doesn't seem right. I mean, I, I've, I've never tried it, so let's go to the gym and try it. So, so I had my student, Joyce, you know, this... Uh, this uh, female MMA uh, student just slapped me as hard as she could repeatedly in the side of the neck. And it was like, you know, it's not comfortable. It's not nice to get slapped, right. but it's like, right. I'm still fully conscious. And, and now, you know, assuming I had bad intentions toward her in the first place, yeah. they would be worse intentions at that point. Right. So exactly. again, even, even good self-defense instructors can make mistakes like that. Obviously any, anybody can. Sure. So the, my whole point of making those videos is to to get people to to question a little bit. Just just try out your stuff. Yeah. Before you put 100% confidence in it, just exactly. put it to the test, even if that test is mild resistance. And that's what what's so lacking in many of the traditional arts that pressure testing. And to oh, me, man. that's one of the greatest things about MMA. A question I get all the time is how what what about street fights? What about street fights? And and I always tell people don't get into street fights. Yeah. They're like, well, well, how do I not get into street fights? Yeah. And my simple answer is don't be the type of guy that people want to fight. Yeah. And sometimes people think, yeah. You know, when and I was, I'm not, when I'm I not saying don't, don't try to be. I had a friend who always attracted violence, just like you say. He would end up in street fights all the time. And, and he was a pretty okay guy. I mean, we were friends. He wasn't a douchebag or an asshole, but still he ended up in fights a lot. He got robbed a lot and he just lacked that situational awareness. It's what I like to call it. The Japanese term is zanshin. Just knowing mm. where to be and, and not be at the wrong mm. place at the wrong time, essentially. I mean, if you're walking down the street and you see a, a, a gang coming at you, just walk to the other side of the street. Don't think that just because I'm a martial artist, I should be able to walk and face this gang of thugs, right? It's just so stupid. <laughs> And for this reason, I've won every single street fight in my life by not ending up in a street fight. Yes, exactly. Same right. here, man. Same here. Right. It, I, I get asked constantly, like, how many street fights have you, you been in? And my answer is zero. You're undefeated. And, and people sense. are like, what? Undefeated in street fighting? Exactly. Yeah. And if I you've been in hundreds of street fights then you are the problem, basically. Yeah, yeah, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I just hope that my future kids enjoy that same lack of manhood. 